Welcome to our video series on generative AI. I'm Kevin Boyd, the CIO at the University of Chicago. I'm very pleased to welcome Sanjay Krishnan, who's a, a faculty member at the University of Chicago. And uh, today we're going to be talking about an introduction to generative AI. So Sanjay, um, if I can ask you, maybe if you could just for us briefly introduce generative AI and tell us a little bit about why this has become such a significant part of the technology landscape and conversation today. Absolutely, Kevin, thank you for having me. So uh, generative AI is a catch-all term for using statistical techniques to generate a significant amount of multimedia content. So whether that content be language, images, video, uh, we're seeing this new technology on the, on the horizon that not only can analyze data, but can also potentially generate new types of data based on simple human inputs. Okay, um, so the concept of AI has been around for a while. How does generative <clears throat> AI differ from the AI that we've been talking about for a while? Good, good. So uh, I think at its heart, Generative AI, as we're talking about it today, is based on a core piece of technology called statistical machine learning. And uh, what statistical machine learning does is it looks at large amounts of data and tries to identify patterns in that large amount of data. And um, what we have really found over the last few years is that there are interesting scaling effects with data. As you collect larger and larger data sets, you can model richer and richer patterns. The same way that a literature scholar sees motifs that cut across multiple books, these models see common themes in images and videos across the scale of the internet. And you pick up enough of these motifs and enough of these themes, you can start being able to generate very convincing content on the other side of it. So that's really interesting, and and I think like when we talk about generative AI, for some of the people that I talk with, they feel like this just came out of nowhere. Like all of a sudden, all we could talk about was ChatGPT and Bard and some of these tools. But um, I think you and I know that that's not really the case. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of generative AI? Absolutely, and I, I really think that the, question, the real question we should be asking is why here and why now? And with generative AI, it's a confluence of really three factors that we're already on the horizon. First, the internet has created a vast major, vast corpus of human created data that is largely publicly accessible. So first we have an extremely large amount of data of human content, of human generated content, and richly annotated with website titles and URLs and, and links and so on. So we not only have data, we have a lot of rich annotations and metadata about this data. That's kind of part one. Part two is that we've seen technologically over the last two decades the rise of something called uh, deep neural networks. And this modeling technology has allowed us to find richer and richer patterns in data. And the last thing is the rise of cloud computing has allowed us to not only think about these models and think about them philosophically, but actually train them practically. So these three things, cloud computing, internet scale data, and deep neural networks is really, it's natural. The natural next step is, uh, is, is convincing multimedia content synthesis. And that's, that's been where AI has been going for the last 10 years. And I think it's been realized because a, a lot of different pieces have actually come together. So from your perspective, what would you say is it that makes AI particularly important? Is it, is it really the pivotal thing for this techno technological era? Good. So uh, I, I think that the best way to think about what makes this new brand of AI transformative is really the changes to the human computer interface that I think are on the horizon. Yeah. Uh, when we think about computers, when I think about computers when I was a kid, uh, it took a substantial amount of expertise to use even a simple program. Uh, I think that when we start seeing software that has natural language understanding, it can understand English prompts that you're giving it, or it can understand the visual world, or it can understand videos. Usually computers just thought of this type of data as just bytes on disk. Now it can really understand the what and the why of that data uh, more than we could ever do before. Now, there are always going to be pros and cons to everything, and like sometimes these computers are going to get things wrong, but I think I see that as the transformative piece here, right? That the way that humans interact with computers before was programmatic, now it might be much more conversational in the way that we are talking today, just because we have given these computers new understanding of, of language. And I think for many of us who are using these tools, it is fascinating how we can chat with them, interact with them, ask them questions, ask them to do something for us, and it seems like they, they respond, they answer, they are, they're able to understand our question and respond in a way similar to yeah. what a, a human being might do. 
Um, so the way you're describing that sounds like a, a pretty important milestone or landmark in the evolution of computers. Um, as you think about the advancements of AI and generative AI, are there other things that you see as major milestones on the, on the, on the path, either things that we've seen in the last few years or things that you see coming? Absolutely. And I, th I think that every time that there's been a shift in computing, there's been a corresponding shift in society, right? Like when the World Wide Web came out, I don't think anyone could have projected the world we would have been in two decades later because of the internet, because of social media. And all of those were natural consequences of the technology in hindsight, right? When we you create this decentralized marketplace of information, suddenly all these new products, all these new services, economies, impact on government all happens. I think AI is in that 1990s World Wide Web stage today, right? That we're seeing a change in the way that humans interact with computers, much in the same way the internet was a change, the World Wide Web was a change in the way that humans are going to interact with computers. Um, the, the, lim the, the economic, social, technological impacts are limitless. And um, I, I'll give you an example from, oddly enough, our own field of computer science. We're seeing that there's a generational shift with the next generation of programmers on how they program code. They're increasingly using these tools to help them, right? And uh, that's one example, but I'm sure in every single industry, we're gonna see a similar, similar kind of story. A story where somebody is using AI in a way that we actually didn't expect, but is great. It's like a, it, it showcases the technology. So as someone who was in the industry with the um, introduction to the World Wide Web and now being here for this, they do feel similar. But it also feels like this is happening at a much faster pace. Do you think that's true or is that just a perception? I, I, think, it's, I think it's one of those things that is hard to say. I think that um, I think seeing how the next so many years pan out is going to be uh, really interesting because I think that there are differences, right? Uh, I think that when we, um, one, one example that I always give is that while the World Wide Web was this revolutionary idea of a decentralized set of servers all hosting content, that content was all public, uh, there's, there's kind of a different market impulse on the generative AI side, a little bit more of consolidation, where there are a few major players that seem to be consolidating data rather than diffusing it around the world, right? And seeing how that plays out will be really interesting, right? And I think that, um, I think that, um, I don't think anybody actually has a clear answer of how this world is going to uh, play out. But uh, I think that it's an exciting time to be a computer scientist. We're seeing a lot of renewed interest in our field, as well as I think people from areas that didn't imagine that they would ever use AI for seeing applications of it now. So let's continue with that. Um, it seems like generative AI has application across many different fields. Yeah. Um, can you highlight a few areas where you think it's going to be really be transformative? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that there are, uh, there are a lot of fields where I think, again, I go back to my, my, my thought process on how I think about generative AI. The key thing that it has changed is a human computer interface. There are a lot of fields where a, a creative has to spend a substantial amount of work convincing a computer on how to act on their creation, right? Whether it's a designer figuring out exactly how to get Photoshop to position something just in the way that they want it to be positioned, or whether it's a website, a website programmer figuring out, oh man, this link is not the right color. I have no idea why. I, th I find that that is going to be where the first wins of generative AI happen. It's going to allow people who are creative to work with computers better. Now, there is, like with every piece of technology, I think that there would be a bunch of people who would argue with that, saying that ultimately this generative AI tool, these generative AI tools are, are trained on the products of creatives. And that is absolutely true, and that is going to be something that as society we're going to have to sort out. But I think that that is where I see the first place of impact, that changing the human computer interface. Where there was before a struggle with getting a computer to do exactly what you wanted to do, this is where these tools are going to help. And just as we see programmers already using it to write routine pieces of code or even debug complex pieces of code that they just can't see what the bug is, I think that that's going to be the next step. It's going to hit every single one of these applications. And the way I think about generative AI, changing the human, human computer interface. So as someone who's, who has tried to make some of these uh, image editing tools yeah. do what I wanted yeah. to do, that example really resonates with me because it's amazing how much easier some of these new tools like uh, Dolly and, yeah. and others, Midjourney and, and the like, I can tell it 
in fairly English language, you know, I want to see a, a dog uh, in a spacesuit on the moon, and I get that. Like that's that makes it uh, possible for someone like me, who's not a graphic designer, to fairly quickly and easily do some of these tasks. But you highlighted um, that potentially there are um, intellectual property concerns <clears throat> of doing some of those things, as you know, much of this has been trained on other people's work. Um, I'm sure that there are challenges with generative AI. Can you talk a little bit about those? And as a computer scientist, what are some of the potential ways that you see to solve some of the challenges? Abso absolutely, and I, and, I and I think that the ghosts of the early days of the World Wide Web have never gone away, right? The same way the internet raised complicated questions about ownership and licensing and now misinformation, we have exactly those same concerns with generative AI, right? The question is, who owns the data that uh, goes into these models? Who owns the outputs of these models? And the intellectual property or the intellectual property regulations around these models, like how can these models be licensed, as well as I think the ethical questions about what happens if these models are used to generate deep misinformation or deep fakes of different different political personalities. There are so many, there are so many complicated questions in this whole world. But I think that that's a feature, right? I think that we wouldn't be having the way to think about this, and I, I always tell my students this, is don't be discouraged by this negative, uh, the, the negative uh, press around generative AI. Mm -hmm. The fact that we're having these conversations means that this technology is interesting enough to work, right? We wouldn't have this con these conversations if it was useless, right? I think we're only having this conversation because people see both the utility and the drawbacks. And having a balanced discussion about the utility, where this technology is, what the technology is, and what it isn't, uh, is an important part of understanding how do we as a society and as a broader computing community reason about the drawbacks as well. That's helpful. And so let me uh, let me give you a question on the other side uh, of the balance, as it were. Um, I asked you about the, some of the challenges on the negative side. What do you see as some of the exciting or the the emerging trends or development that that you're really looking forward to? I I I again lean back on this theme of it changes the human computer interface. Mm -hmm. And I am just excited to see how a new generation of kids, the same way we saw a generation of kids raised with social media, we saw the pros and the cons, we're going to see a new generation of kids raised with ubiquitous AI. And raised with technology that they can communicate with, raised with technology that they can talk to. And I think we're going to see uh, an exciting new world of democratized technology where people can work with computers that traditionally maybe have been excluded by the computing community. On the other hand, we will see negatives the same way we see with social media. And I think that that to me is going to be exciting. It's going to be, I think that a lot of the promises of democratizing computing and making it applicable to a, to a broader community and a broader world, making these power tools that we've been designing in the computer science community applicable to everyone, is sort of coming to fruition, but there are a lot of there are a lot of storm clouds on that on that horizon as well. So I, I think that that's it's a great way to think about this, right? There are we we see all of these opportunities, but there are real problems that we should we need to reckon with uh, as people developing this technology. So to close out this segment, let me um, ask you to tell us a little bit about your personal journey with uh, generative AI, really, and how. Um, how you've seen it evolve so far and um, and how you view the potential for the future. Ab absolutely. So I am a data person born and bred. Like I love everything. I love everything about data. I have worked on projects in AI ranging from digital archaeology to medicine to robotics. I've, sp I've spent my entire career thinking about how do we extract insights from data. And it is amazing to me that generative AI works. I always find it still like I still sometimes think I'm dreaming when I'm working with some of these applications because it's so weird as a person who spent their entire life programming to suddenly talk to a piece of code that you've written, right? So I think that I think that there's one part of me that is just is kind of incredulous that this actually works, right? And uh, and incredulous that the underlying technology does what it does, right? Uh, I think that my personal journey is that I am always curious about this technology from day one, from the first day that ChatGPT was released. I've been playing around with this. I've been trying different things, seeing what happens, trying to train my own models, see what happens. And uh, I think that that's how I've been learning about this. And it's been less from some taking out a pen and paper and writing out some math equations. And it's been more like, let's play around with this. And 
it's kind of amazing to me where this technology has come because when I started in this field, I would not have guessed we'd be having this type of a conversation today. So that's really interesting. And that's probably good, really good advice for some of our students who want to get into this, which is to get in, try it, play with it, experiment. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the best way to understand capabilities, right? Because understanding theory without understanding the practical capabilities is not going to help us reconcile with these very real problems that are there today. Because the problems that we're talking about, 20 years ago, when people used to talk about AI safety, it was a philosophical conversation. I remember at a conference that I was at, somebody was talking about AI safety and a, and a faculty member stood up in the audience and saying, that's like talking about terraforming Mars, right? And it was, uh, I think that those types of conversations have now become very, very real. And I think the first step is understanding capabilities, understanding what, what, is, what kind of practical capabilities do these tools actually have today? That's great. And I'm really glad that you mentioned data because I think data is going to be a common theme in several of the modules of this uh, generative AI series. Absolutely. So Sanjay, thank you so much for uh, joining me today for this uh, introduction to generative AI. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, making the time. And uh, thank you to uh, all of you for joining us. I hope you'll uh, come back and join us for uh, more of the segments. Thank you.